Tuesday. It is Tuesday, May 16th, the 136th day of the year. There are 229 days remaining in the year 2023. And welcome to another edition of Tuesdays with Tom. Mother's Day has come and gone. Mother's Day always seems to take me back to my high school days. <clears throat> when I speak of my high school days at John Carroll Catholic High School, my wife will always remind me that I had what she considers a true integration experience. First time she said it, it struck me and it has stayed with me. See, I attended high school in the late 1960s in Birmingham, Alabama, and there were quite a few attempts at school integration during that period of time, but there were few true integration experiences. I attribute that true integration and my involvement in it to my mom. She insisted I go to school at John Carroll. She had attended a Catholic school and realized the value. She turn, it turns out that my mom knew best. See, I attended college in the 1970s at Auburn University and that experience turned out to be more of an assimilation experience. In high school, there were a few of us black students, but we were one in how we saw the world and our experience in it. We would integrate into the total experience rather than to have to totally assimilate. In college, we had to assimilate. Either we were going to assimilate or be left out. It's taken me many years to realize the difference, or maybe it took me many years to admit what was right in front of my eyes, and that was that my mom was right. I think back to not wanting to go to that school, putting up a big argument with my mom. But thank goodness she knew better. Integration, to integration, true integration rather, has worked out much better than a simulation. And for that, I thank my mom. Our G-List guests today are Dr. Holly Cost and Rachel Snotty to discuss the Auburn University Outreach and Extension Services Partnership to bring a new innovative virtual healthcare station offered by OnMed to the Chambers County Health and Wellness Center. OnMed represents somewhat of a future of virtual medicine. So this edition of Tuesday of Tom, of course, is sponsored by our partners, the Best Girl Consulting Firm. Best Girl has been providing customized solutions to executive issues for nearly 36 years. Yesterday, well, this was last week, we celebrated our 36 year in business. Let's hear from Best Girl. Best Girl is a consulting firm that provides customized leadership, access and inclusion, public relations, communications, and organizational consulting services. Clients include Fortune 500 companies, utilities, higher education institutions, small businesses, and associations. Best Girl's team of consultants led by Joyce Gilly Gossam, Emily Hedrick, and Sean Jones partners with business and education clients to promote organizational effectiveness, communication, motivation, and leadership with always an impact on the bottom line. Best Girls customized consulting services include strategic planning, corporate communication, executive coaching, fundraising, and economic development. Best Girl creates the solution that fits your needs. So let's go to our roundtable regulars and introduce Barbara Wallace Edwards and Michael Walker. Good morning, Barbara Wallace Edwards and Michael Walker. How are you guys doing? Uh, good morning, Tom. Doing well. I hope you and Barbara both are doing well. Doing well. Good morning. I'm doing so well. So I will <clears throat> we'll just go back, excuse me, a couple of days to Mother's Day. Barbara, did you have a good Mother's Day? I did, Tom. It was a rather relaxing day for me after church. I had a friend to invite me down to the lake, so I went to the lake and set out, and just watched the, the waves wash up, and went out to dinner and had a great day. So it was it was a good one. Michael, I've often heard you talk about your grandmother and the lessons that she and your grandfather gave you in life. How was your day? It was good. It certainly brought back memories of my childhood. And of course, on Mother's Day, I thought of my grandmother and, and like you said, all the lessons and the words of wisdom that uh, she shared with me, as well as my grandfather. You know, I wish I had the opportunity to go down to visit their graves on uh, Mother's Day, but I wasn't able to do so. But I certainly thought about 
doing that, just taking a ride down. Now they're in Auburn. That was, yes. You guys, yes. you grew up in Auburn. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, all right. So you got it, Bar Barbara, you got anything for us? Well, Tom, I want to start off first by uh, offering continued graduation, congratulations to all of our graduates. There are still college graduations, high school graduations going on. And there are two special young ladies to me that um, one graduated from Clemson this past weekend, Jordan Lewis, uh, graduated with honors. And um, she's a young lady I watched grow up here in Birmingham and her mom is a dear friend and also an Auburn alum. And so I'm very proud of Jordan. She's headed off to medical school. And then my young cousin who will be graduated from high school this weekend, Jordan Taylor in Tennessee. So congratulations to both of those young ladies and to all of our graduates. Okay, sounds good. Michael, what do you got for me? Well, I got a couple things. The uh, first thing is, you know, the Second Amendment right. You know, the Second Amendment right is the, the right to, to bear arms. A strong and, militia. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, and today with all the gun violence and everything going around, there's a, a hot debate about the Second Amendment, but I want to kind of discuss the issue with Ja Morant, the Grizzly point guard from the Memphis Grizzly. He just was filmed uh, over the weekend flashing and brandishing a gun I on did. video. And again, again, again. <laughs> again. And he was just suspended indefinitely by the Memphis Grizzly. You know, he served an eight game suspension during the year. Right. And, you know, it's becoming somewhat of a habit. I told somebody that, you know, this is who he is. You know, right. this is the person he's been all along. Right. He's just not able to do it. But the interesting thing about it is, and a couple ex-professionals, one guy, Shannon Shard, says, John, you have a $200 million contract to play basketball. Why are you running around here acting like you're a gangster? There's no need for you to do that. And just recently, Keyshawn Johnson said that John Morant has caught the attention of a Los Angeles gang leader. And he is kind of ticked off with John Morant going around in the NBA pretending to be a gangster when he was not. And, right. you know, how people in the game were killed to be in his position. You know, uh, it's, I, I don't know where this can end or where it would lead for him, because you, you think that you would sit down and say, I'm living this lifestyle over here and I didn't get here by being a gangster. I got here because I had talent on loan from God to play basketball. I can do so many other things with it. But instead, he has his other split personality is saying, you're a gangster now. You can be a gangster. And I, I just don't understand. Then you got some people saying, well, he has the Second Amendment right. You know, I don't know if the Second Amendment right gives you the authority to act a fool just because you have the right. You know, you have the right to do a lot of things, but it doesn't mean you should do them. You know, the Second Amendment right gives you the opportunity to <laughs> the right defend yourself but i mean to, again that's just foolish actions but why why are you just there's no need you're not your life is not in danger why are you going around carrying a gun brandishing it on videos and he knows he got in trouble before what would make him think it's okay to do it a second time what will that's make him think it's okay to do it a second time is that he didn't suffer punishment the first time they let him off because he was john moran and I remember uh, one of the commentators saying that, that, hey, that, you know, he, he got suspended for eight days. What is eight days, man? So you get suspended today, you can start playing again next week. And uh, I just, I, I, you know, there's something about, and, and apparently he's with this guy he grew up with. Yes. Who may be legitimately a thug. I don't know. Yeah. Um Michael and I have had this conversation about our respective sons. And, you know, a lot of times um, middle class kids, you know, they, they, they want to pretend to be gangsters. Yes, you know, yes. they, they want uh, 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 
you know, and, and I was I told Michael the story of I put my son in the car one day. And I said, come on, we're going somewhere. And he said, where are we going? I said, come on. So we got in the car and I took him down to the projects. And right. I said, OK, you can get out now. What do you mean? I said, you you want to be a gangster? This is where they, that they are right over there. <laughs> this is there. where they live. <laughs> I ain't getting out the car. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about your behavior. Right. And, right. and, and let's see if we can't correct it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know. I feel bad. Where did he go to college? Uh, Murray State. Where, where is that? I think, is that I think it was Kentucky? Murray State. It's in t Kentucky? Okay. Uh, somewhere in that area, yes. Well, and I remember can... they played Auburn. It was either Murray State or Morgan State, one of those two, two schools. Yeah, I think and... it was Murray. Morgan's yeah. an HBCU. It is. Okay, okay so it was HBCU. Murray State, yeah. yeah. And I remember they played against Auburn, and he just showed out. You know, he's right. very talented and everything. He grew up in Sumter, South Carolina. But um, it's, it's almost like, I guess, you know, they say when you're that age, he's 23 years old you know, has a $200 million contract, he feels invincible, you know, and that he can do whatever he wants to do. Um, and I guess he's not thinking about the younger kids that look up to him that may right. want to be like him. Right. And he's setting such a poor example for them, you know, by doing this. But again, I don't think he's thinking past. Yes. Tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Or, the, or the moment. That's that moment in, in general. I mean, you know, he risked losing all kinds of contracts and, and endorsements and his whole entire livelihood. I, I just don't understand. Well, I'm going to I'm going to probably take exception to that. And the fact that everybody talks about how much money he's losing. To me, that's not the issue. It's not. The issue is he should be conducting himself in a better manner. In a right. manner that, as Michael said, make these young kids want to look up to him and be like him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, he's going to make a lot of money. I mean, that's what they, they, they make it playing basketball. But um, I think there's more to it to that. And, you know, and what is he, 22? 22, 22, 23. 23. 23. Yeah. I think when he gets to be 27, 28, he'll be a different human being. And what he, he's got to do is bridge that gap between 23 and 30 years old. And hopefully he'll make it because uh, he could not, you know, right. especially when you're, when you're waving around guns. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we've had this conversation before. I've probably got five guns in this house and uh, a couple of them I've never shot. Um, and I don't ever want to shoot them, to be honest with you. Um, so anyway, that's John Moran. I'm going to go back to something you mentioned earlier, Michael. Um, you know, yesterday I thought, man, when we I was getting ready to put this together, put the show together, I was thinking, God Almighty, looks like we're going to go a whole week without a mass shooting. Mm -hmm. And but they had to get it in under the wire. Yes. And, uh, yeah. We had a mass shooting in New Mexico. Yes. And it seems to be... Now they are maybe getting younger and younger, you know, Yes. that's going out and doing this. So, you know, I guess the guy that, that shot people in Texas or something, they were saying that, you know, he was uh, a loner or, you know, he had a lot of issues. He had a, there was some video he did that was hate filled and racially motivated against Hispanic people. And he was Hispanic. And, wow. you know, he was trying to assume or act as though he was white and, you know, just pushing white supremacy and, and all kinds of crazy. So this kid was really mixed up. And supposedly he had issues because he wasn't able to develop relationships with the opposite sex and all of this type of stuff. So I think some of this stuff really goes back to, to mental health, you know, and it's a lot more, let's just say, people that are unstable are a lot more prevalent than we think or want to believe, you know, because what you said before, they can't connect the dots right now. Yeah. They don't think about the repercussions of their actions. They just have a thought and they just act 
you know, impulsive right. and never think about what could happen. What are the repercussions? And it's almost like they're going to get back at somebody. Right. And who that somebody is uh, ends yeah. up being people, just innocent people. Right. Going to a shopping mall, you know. Yeah. And I don't know about you guys, but I'll be honest with you, man. I am uh, very aware now when I yes when I'm out. You have to be publicly, you know. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's the world we're living in. And, yes. And, uh, um, <clears throat> I think if we're relying on politicians to change it, that's not going to happen. No, it's not. So I I I, I don't know. So, Barbara, you got anything else? Yes, I, I do want to mention something else, uh, Tom. I don't know if you all have seen this article that I just read last night that the Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, signed a bill into law Monday barring the state colleges and universities from spending money on diversity, equity, and, and inclusions programs um, and is limiting how race can be discussed in many courses. And we, we've had that discussion before, and that just it just blows me away and I, I i'm afraid this this is just the tip of the iceberg we could probably going to see more and more of this type of thing happening in other states as well and it's sad well that's what he's chosen to run on what they call yes. cultural issues and uh, divisive issues i call them george wallace issues he reminds yes. me of george growing up with george wallace who was always something to keep people divided and um I, I think in a lot of ways, this has hurt him in his quest to be president of the United States because he can't run to the right of Trump. Right. Uh, he can't say things that might piss Trump off. So he's kind of in a, in a little hole here. Right. And doesn't know what else to do. So what does he do? He picks on the people that can't fight back. Yeah, exactly. Michael, you got anything else? Yeah, I do. I have a bombshell report that's just dropped. Boy, he started grinning uh -oh. when he said that. I didn't Here do it. <laughs> I can't wait to hear this one. I do. Okay. Let's a lady it, by the name of Noel Dunphy, a New York-based public relations professional, has filed a lawsuit against America's former mayor, Rudy Giuliani. Oh, yeah. Mm. And it's for unlawful abuse of power, wide-ranging sexual assault and harassment, wow. wage theft, and other misconduct. <laughs> she also said where she, while she worked for him from 2019 to 2020, he had her work in the nude. Wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, what? And, <laughs> well, I, I, and, and she worked from 2019 to 2020? <laughs> he had had her working in the nude, and her job was to perform sexual favors for him. Wow. Yeah. On an as-needed basis. Now, supposedly, allegedly, this is all alleged, this is her lawsuit, but allegedly, he also informed her that he and the former president were selling pardons for $2 million a piece. And if she knew somebody that needed a pardon, let him know. And that's, that's come out too. Yeah, now there has not been true. any, there has not been any evidence that that were the case, but if you remember, and I kind of thought about this, how Trump was, getting all these rappers pardons and stuff you remember you went through a phase where he was getting all these they had the two million dollars right to pay and so i'm not saying it is i'm just saying i thought it was kind of strange that he was always coming to the rapper's defense yes you know and giving them a pardon now this will all be hashed out but even if that part is not true She's saying that Rudy made her work in the nude and she had to perform sexual favors for him while she it's was working. Supposedly, he was going to pay her a million dollars a year. That's right. Uh, that's why and she, what was her job words, title? It, was, it was a job she took. Uh, her her, her, her time was director of business development. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So <laughs> new name now we for know. It, huh? Hey, now we know why Rudy was sweating all that, <laughs> that shoe died out of his head. <laughs> <laughs> what the song says, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we'll it all see. makes sense. <laughs> we'll, see what, we'll see what happens next with, with Rudy. Rudy can't stay out of the headlines. That's no. <laughs> I read that. That was funny. <laughs> okay, anything else for you guys? No, All right, sir. well, let's go to Sean. She's got a minute for us. Sean, you out there? You got a minute? Good morning to everyone joining in with us this morning. My name is Shantia Jones, and this is Got a Minute. It's Tuesday, May 16th, and on this day in 1980, Los Angeles Lakers point guard Irvin Magic Johnson steps in for an injured center, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Magic scored 42 points, which led the Lakers from a four games to two series win over the Philadelphia 76ers for their first championship since 1972. No one expected that Magic, a six foot nine inch player, the tallest point guard in league history, would so easily make the transition to center. Magic rang up 42 points, 15 rebounds, and seven assists to lead the Lakers to the victory and was named most valuable player for the finals. The first three of, of such awards in his career. Lakers went on to dominate the NBA, winning a total of five championships in the 1980s. Now, before I go, I'd like to take this time just to say that the holidays are some of the most loneliest times of the year. Check on the people you care about and hug them a little tighter every chance you get. Oftentimes, we will never know when they need it. So until then, thank you all for joining in. My name is Shantia Jones, and this is Got A Minute. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, I think magic also is in the ownership talk for the Washington Commanders. He is a part of the group, yes. And he's all, I don't know, does he still own a piece of the Dodgers and the Lakers? Not no. the Lakers, but I think the Dodgers. Okay. Go ahead, yeah. Magic. Um, I got to visit with Magic once at his office in Los Angeles. He's Irvin to everybody else. So you call him Irvin, because if you call him Magic, so you don't really, you don't know him, you don't know him, you know, it's like, I know Irvin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds up faces with him, I like that. All right, so let's go on to our G-list guest. Hollywood has the A-list, and here on Tuesdays with Tom, we have the G-list. The G-list guest today are Dr. Holly Cost and Rachel Snodding. They will discuss the Auburn University Outreach and Alabama Extension Services Partnership to bring a new innovative virtual healthcare station offered by OnMed to the Chambers County Community Health and Wellness Center. OnMed represents the future of virtual medicine. Holly Campbell Koss is the Assistant Vice President for University Outreach and Public Service at Auburn University. I would love to say she was the former mayor of the city of Montevallo, one of my favorite places, from 2012 to 2020. Uh, she was also on the city council there. Uh, during her two-year tenure as mayor, the city completed over $10 million in capital projects, including a complete Main Street renovation and 167 park development and construction of the new city hall. Rachel Snotty is the Chamber County Extension Coordinator for the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service System of the Auburn University. She's been with Extension for 12 years she worked primarily, has worked primarily with 4-H youth development programs during her extension career. And I could go on and on and on, but we will get to do that when we ask some questions. Let's 
bring Rachel and Dr. Cost on, please. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. How you doing, Tom? I'm doing great. How you ladies doing? Doing well. Happy to be doing here. Great. Good. Well, we're glad you're here. Well, well, you got Michael and Barbara there, and they've got some questions for you. And uh, anything else you want to talk about? So, who's up first? You tell us. Barbara. Here. Barbara. Um, Holly and Rachel, thank you for joining us this morning. And I'm excited about this this project. Um, it, there has always been a concern about there not being enough doctors in the state, especially in rural areas. So what has been the impact of OnMed going into Chambers County? Tell us about the, the entire OnMed and what all that means for the, the people that live in that community in Chambers County. Rachel, would you like to start or you want me to sure. kick it off? I, I can. So um, since I'm, I work in Chambers County and spend a lot of time there with the community um, and everybody has been super excited to have Auburn University more plugged into the community um, and they have shown up and shown out at our health center where the on med telehealth station is located. Um, they've been super impressed with the technology um, in on med. And um, the fact that it's in Lafette, everybody's like, why here? <laughs> so they're super excited to have um, this additional health care service in um, Chambers County and Lafette specifically. Um, so it's, it's been really exciting to see their excitement uh, to have this resource for them. That's great. And so it doesn't take the place of a doctor, but it is an, like an asset to a yes. doctor. Is that correct? Go, yes, go it is. Well, um, so they they do actually speak with clinicians, licensed. Um, they have various um, qualifications. Um, and so, yeah, they could use it for, you know, it's kind of like if you were to go to urgent care, um, to, if you, you know, have an illness, especially because we open the center with access to the on-med station on weekends and evenings. Um, we extended those hours so that people could have this, you know, outside of normal doctor's office hours. Um, and so... Yeah, it, it is sort of supplemental, I guess, because there's only so many things you can do on telemedicine. Um, but it is really neat, all the features of the on-med station, because they have blood pressure cuffs in there and scales and, you know, the infrared camera and uh, HD camera and stethoscope. So it has more features than just doing telehealth on your phone. Um, but we do still also encourage them to call the doctor if needed. Um, and so it is, it is an additional resource. Can you, one of you guys, would you describe it? I thought we might have had a photo of it or what have you, but can you describe what this actually looks like and how it operates? Sure. I'm, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, uh, some people call it a new age uh, phone booth. It's about seven by 11. Um, and so you walk in and, and you just really walk in just like an old school phone booth. But when you walk in, you see this big screen and there's just a button on it says start. You press start and then a, a, someone comes up on the screen and it's a life size clinician and asks you what you're there to what you're there for. And they take all of your information. And so that's particularly helpful when you have some folks that may have some problems also with literacy. So you don't have to go and fill out all those forms that you normally have to fill out in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. And uh, so once they identify what your needs are, then they connect you with either a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner. And then that nurse practitioner will give you that complete evaluation with the diagnostic tools that are in the station. So uh, you walk in and you do step on a scale, which is my least favorite part. I'll admit it. <laughs> but it takes your temperature. It can also identify what areas of your body might have an infection just based on the infrared uh, uh, the lighting, um, wow. the thermal imaging, then they have the scopes will come out of the ceiling. And so there's a high definition camera that can examine your eyes, up your nose and your throat and your ears. Wow. Um, wow. They also have a stethoscope um, and then it can take your blood pressure and then also your pulse and your oxygen levels. So it's really thorough. Can't draw blood, um, but they can do 85% of what you would normally do in a doctor's office. Wow. Great. So, uh, Michael, you were involved in this. Matter of fact, you introduced me to it several years ago. Um, your questions or your well, comments. Well, comment, first of all, is that <clears throat> the way I came about it is through a relationship with the former head of OnMed. He and I met about six years ago, and 
he found out I was in the healthcare space and he was telling me about this product that he was working on. And so we continued to talk about it. And as it became closer to uh, fruition, I went down and visited him and got more and more information on and saw what they were doing. And I said, well, this is something that Auburn could use, especially through outreach, because Auburn being a land grant institution, having the Auburn University Extension Service, I had some familiarity with it. And I knew that this would be something that Auburn could really make an impact within the community around it, especially today, because you have so many people in rural areas that do not have access to health care because right. doctors are no longer there. So from that standpoint, I said, this would be something good. So I talked to Tom about it and gave him some videos. And we ended up um, talking to the president. Tom went to the president. And he said, I like it. That was former President Gouge. And he said, I like it. And so it started from there. So one thing, uh, Rachel and, and Holly, is that the OnMed Center can disperse prescription medication as well. It can. I'm glad you mentioned that. And I do want to thank you for bringing this to us because I feel like it has a capacity to fill a huge gap in right. the state of Alabama and rural areas. So it's tremendous. But it does have the capacity to dispense prescription medication. Um, but currently we can only dispense the prescriptions themselves and send those to the pharmacies because in the state of Alabama, the state pharmacy board um, does not yet permit the automatic dispensing of prescriptions. So we're working on that. I know the executives at OnMed are also working on that. So mm -hmm. we really hope that'll work. Um, one question about that was how would that impact the local pharmacies? But the best answer there is the local pharmacy would actually own the pharmacy inside the telehealth station. So this would not be competition. This would actually be an asset for them. So we're looking forward to the time when we can dispense those prescriptions. And we have already talked to the local pharmacy because they're actually right next door. <laughs> and so it's really easy access for them. Uh, and so we, once we get those capabilities, we would essentially be extending their hours because we're open with their, our center is open later than, than they are. Um, and so they're really excited about that possibility. Yeah. yeah. And, and as, we, I as I understand it, they can get over the counter medications there as well. They don't have to go out, you know, out to a local store to buy that. They can actually get medication set on med as well right well it's like the 220 most commonly prescribed non-narcotic medications okay. that they can put in there um, and so yeah we would hopefully be able to include some of those on over-the-counter medications as well that's great there are so many possibilities for this what about other locations and, and maybe rachel for those of people that's in our audience that really do not understand what the extension program is at Auburn. Maybe take a little time to talk about it. I'll, I'll just say that my first uh, introduction to it was through my grandmother. She used to work with the Auburn University Extension Service uh, a long time ago. But you recall back in those days where the government would provide uh, food for people that were in um, food deserts, so to speak. Now, that's the new term where people that did not have enough access to nutritious food. The extension service hired my grandmother to go out to the people that received it and teach them how to prepare it so the food wouldn't go to waste. So right. that was my first introduction to the extension service and that it was really more about the community. But if you will, go ahead and, and explain all the different things that the extension service at Auburn University does. Yes, well, that could take a while. <laughs> um, we do a lot. We are, um, Extension is located in all 67 counties in Alabama. Um, and so we are the education and outreach arm from our land grant universities. So we are under Alabama a and and Auburn University. And um, so our programs, yes, we still have um, agents who go out and do food preservation like that. Um, but we have a lot of people know us as our ag education um, because we do work with a lot of farmers and landowners to help with any issues they're having. Um, but we can, we also do a lot of nutrition education. We do diabetes management education. Um, we have 4-H agents who, which is 4-H is a youth program. Um, and so we have educational programs and um, experiences for youth. Um, like we take kids out on the river, go kayaking. We do STEM programs. We um, have workforce development programs, um, a lot more than just the ag and animal science that people typically associate with extension. Um, we have grown a lot in, in the past decades because um, fewer and fewer 
farmers and people with big properties um, are around. And so we uh, have ad adapted to, to have other, other opportunities to help educate the public. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of educational programs to help the citizens of Alabama. Um, and it is a nationwide organization as well. Uh, I having some familiarity, I know that you guys, this is a, a project that came together primarily with the help of some corporations in the state of Alabama and some other, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so um, University Outreach has uh, been very privileged to be able to uh, work with different folks on campus. And so we, when we found out about this project, we talked to the provost about it. And so the provost's office uh, contributed a significant amount of funding to the project. But then we also have other partners on campus. Like um, Rachel said, we have Extension. They're a huge partner, obviously. And then we have the College of Nursing. We have the College of Pharmacy and Human Sciences. So between all of those, we have these resources. And a couple of those have been very generous with their funding. Um, one is Blue Cross Blue Shield. They have uh, contributed significantly to the project. And then we also have Alpha um, Corporation. So the Alpha Corporation has contributed as well. And then we have the partners in our community. So we have the city of Lafette, the wonderful, incredible city clerk, Lewis Davidson. If I don't give him a shout out, he'll never speak to me again. <laughs> um, we have the fire chief duty, who's just a rock star. Um, and then we have Chambers County. And we work with Chris Busby there and um, a lot of different folks in Chambers County. But what we got through that was we got this great building and so city owns the building the building needed to be repaired and so we secured a grant through a deca four hundred thousand dollars to renovate the building and then that also wow. pays for the funding of um of our staff there so it's a really interesting i think concept in the funding sources and all of the partners that we have and we're happy to start here but we're even more excited that we're hoping to replicate this all over the state absolutely that's great well holly um and we Rachel explained extension to right. us, and I think I, I understand it. Explain Nobody outreach. Nobody does. <laughs> you work in outreach. Oh, you think you're confused now. Wait till you hear <laughs> outreach. <laughs> <laughs> well, let well, me just say, first of all, outreach is run by our good friend, Dr. Rick Cook. And so can you tell us a little bit about outreach? Please? Yeah, and, and I'm just going to give a disclaimer. I've been working for outreach about two years now. So okay. I do get to work with a wonderful Dr. Rick Cook. And uh, he's the one that brought this concept to us, really, after you present it to them. But I look at outreach as the intersection between the university and the community to help make the world a better place. That is, uh, that's my elevator speech. And we have a there lot of go. different divisions, but we create partnerships um, between the university and the community. So we're out in the school schools, we work with businesses, we work with governmental entities, and we work with those faculty members to really leverage their expertise to help to address the significant issues that we have around the state. And I heard you all talking about gun safety issues and gun violence mm -hmm. issues really before we got on. And, and um, ultimately, that's an issue of public safety. And those are issues mm -hmm. that we can tackle really together with the right community and with the right key players. So um, that's why this particular project has been so beneficial to everyone because we have the partnerships. And while OnMed is really what the project is centered around, it's not just on med, it's not just the medical services. We also have programs that address the specific health needs in the community, such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension. Um, and so we have the faculty experts who are addressing those issues within this facility as well. So that's been, um, I think that will really help with the preventive medicine and that will help with the long-term health care of the community. Sounds oh, great. It's great. Uh, questions, Barbara, Michael. Yeah, Holly, you, you mentioned that you're hoping to replicate this in other counties across the state. Do you know where it may be the next location? Have, have you already pinpointed where you go next? Well, that's interesting because our team meets every week. And so just yesterday we were talking about different locations. And so rather than having a specific telling you a specific location, we have specific criteria in mind. Okay. Uh, we right. want to have a we want to have a dedicated space because just the space issue is really what took us a while to get this um, area up and 
up and running, I guess. Right. Uh, we also want to make sure that they do have that health care shortage and that they have the needs. But also we want communities that are willing to work with us. Um, that is why this has worked so well in Lafette is mm -hmm. because they do have those dynamic leaders. And we work hand in hand. And when I say we talk every day, we talk every day. I'm not wow. kidding. They are. Um, I mean, we are BFFs with uh, with right. Lewis and with Chief Duty. And um, but so we're, we are looking in the Black Belt area. We're hoping over the next two years to launch four more of these, two in West Alabama and two in East Alabama. So we That's do great. have communities in mind, but until we can talk to those community partners, we think it would do them a disservice to put any names out there just right. yet. Right. Thank you. Now, I do. Is it, uh, although it's not, quote, connected to Auburn, there is a Tuskegee uh, on med system, mm -hmm. right? There is. They have one station now. I know they're looking at another station. And while these are not necessarily connected, Auburn University and Tuskegee University have a very strong relationship. We just signed an MOU with them. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to work with Tony Haygood in my previous role as mayor. And then we also have a collaborative between Auburn University and just the Tuskegee community where we're meeting on a regular basis uh, to look at ways that we can connect and collaborate as well. So we're hoping to pull them in as we move forward and develop these community health and wellness centers all over the state because they're just such great partners. That's great. Michael? Well, I want to go back and I want to ask each of you a question. When you first heard about OnMed, what was your initial reaction and thought? First you, Holly, then you, Rachel. Okay, I remember I was in Rick's office, Dr. Cook's office, and it was right after I got hired. And he started telling me about OnMed. And so I immediately went back and researched it, and I was amazed. And I just I was very excited about it and just thought just the capacity that it has to really serve people in rural areas and across the state, I, I thought it was tremendous. My first thought is, let's put him in every Dollar General across the United States. <laughs> you see these everywhere. And uh, yeah. apparently Dollar General wasn't, you know, quite ready for that just yet. But I'm, I'd rather. They got a great it. stock, though. Your stock <laughs> right. they, very they well. Do. They do. But what I do realize is just as a standalone, it'll work as a standalone. But I feel right. like what we're doing is far superior to just having it standalone because then we can follow the patients through and really support the community in ways um, that I think would help to advance the health of the whole community. So, Rachel, what did you think? I, I too, was amazed. I'm um, so when we first, um, Outreach first reached out to Extension, since, like I said, we are in all 67 counties and they were trying to figure out where to put this technology. Um, and so they talked with me and two other counties about, so we could talk about our communities and, and the issues that we had and the needs. Um, and when they were telling us about what OnMed was, I, I mean, it's a game changer for us because we, um, our population in Chambers County we're high in a lot of health issues. We're unhealthy people. <laughs> and so this can solve a lot of the problems that we have. We also have a lot of um, transportation issues. People don't have, uh, we don't have public transportation. We have a senior bus that goes a couple days a week, but not, not something for the general public. Um, and a lot of people have to bum rides from neighbors and um, it's, it's not convenient. And so they needed somewhere that was closer to their home so they could get health care uh, when they need it and to help eliminate some of these health issues that we already are high in. Um, and so I was super excited about the possibilities. Um, we do have one general um, practitioner in Lafette, but they're about to retire and they've been concerned about their patients, what's going to happen after they leave. And so they too are very excited about this. Um, and so I was just seeing how it could solve a lot of problems that we have. Wow. That's great. That's amazing. Wow. And just yes. think, all from Auburn alumni. Right. <laughs> That's right. And the reason why I say that, I remember when I was in class and I was having a, um, a class with one of my professors. Yeah, I think it was communication class. And he said to me, he said, you know, from Auburn, we teach you to go out and create and make an impact on the world, not just go get a job. You know, mm -hmm. and that always stuck with me. And so that's why I said that. And this is coming back, you know, because when I first heard about it 
and I thought, and Tom had been, and I had been talking about what can we do to make an impact at Auburn? Auburn needs to do more with outreach and what have you. And I said, I've got an idea. Let me sh share it with you. So that's, that's fantastic. One of the other things. It's frozen. Yes. To um, practice and and maybe get some coursework in by utilizing Ahmed because they can then get some real on time experience. Can they not? Yes. So Holly, if you don't mind, um, that's one thing that it, it's this project has sort of grown. So it started out with just looking at the Ahmed care station. Um, but then when we found this space that usually used to be a doctor's office, so it has clinic rooms in it. Um, and so we did see how students could come up and utilize that space to hold various health screenings um, for the community. And so we have multiple um, departments that are planning on coming up to do hearing and speech screenings, um, blood pressure, um, monitoring BMI checks. Um, Holly, help me out here. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, we've had over 76 faculty members yeah. who have been engaged with this project. Every single college at the university has been engaged. They are intensely wow. interested in the project as a whole, and particularly with OnMed. So they can interact and they can engage with those clinicians that are in Tampa. Um, they can talk, they can work with the patients to understand more about rural patients and what their concerns and what their needs are. And then we're also looking at creating a health fellows program so that our students could then help to support the patients um, once they've worked with OnMed and OnMed's um, talked to them about what their needs are, then they can help them to carry out the plan. So it's really the continuity of those services. And uh, Michael, I really appreciate what you're saying about us having an impact um, on the community because a lot of people think of Auburn and they think of football, or if they aren't thinking of football, they think of research or they think of instruction, but really this outreach is the intersection between all of those. And that's right. what it's all about. Uh, so, um, again this technology and this model is impacting them but particularly like you said the students when they get to come out there and we've had so many of them out there already we've had a nutrition intern we've had an intern that created a substance use disorder toolkit that intern was actually from uab uh, so we're partnering with other universities now auburn we're going to say we took the lead we we are taking the lead in this but it's not about territory it, it's All really right. about health so we will we'll be interacting and working we've already been working with uab working with the University of Alabama. So uh, happy to have those relationships as well. Well, I agree with you. It's not about being parochial in our thinking or territorial, but we did beat Alabama with something to make it a major impact. We will take it. We may not be getting it on the football field lately, but we will take it here. This is, this is <laughs> I think you'll find that there's a lot of cooperation between the universities okay. in all the areas that count, besides right. football. Um, that's one of the things I discovered when I started doing some of the work we were doing. Uh, any, any, anything else, Holly? Anything else, Rachel? Or Michael or Barbara? I wanted to ask them another question about the medical records, um, the, the history of the patient, why, you know, whether they're at uh, on med and how is that transmitted to their regular doctor, uh, you know, their uh, primary doctor or their hospitals? Is that information housed somewhere that p other physicians and practitioners can have access to it? Currently, the patients have access to that information, and it would be up to them to share okay. it with their doctors. They could request um, for that to be shared, but they do have their own electronic medical record system. Very good. Okay, thank you. So, Holly, tell me about being the mayor of Montevallo. <laughs> How long you got? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, it was. I had the time of my life. I absolutely loved it. We got to do a lot of great things together. And really, it surprised me when I accepted this position at Auburn University, how, my, uh, how many of my skills as mayor translated over to this position. And, uh, and I will say that I ended my term. I um, did not lose an election. Um, I decided not to run again. And really, it was because I wanted to do more around the state. And uh, when this position became available, I thought, 
this is the kind of position that you really can make an impact around the state. And then when this project landed on my, in my lap, oh, wow, I was thrilled. But uh, yeah, I, I can tell you all kind of stories about uh, my, my mayorship if you, if you really want to hear. <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh, so, so Rachel, it, as this, if this project moves around the state, you're being Chambers County, will you move with it? Uh, will you be involved in other areas? Um, so involved, yeah, I think so, um, especially since we hope Extension will continue to stay involved with this project um, as it moves around the state. And so I will um, work with the county extension coordinators in those counties where it ends up um, to help them understand all about the project and um, I guess sort of train them on, on things that I did in the partnership and how I uh, worked with the team. Uh, so, yeah, I do plan to be involved. And we need 67 Rachels. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Rachel is dynamic. She's incredible. And uh, we, we do. We, we need her to just go go everywhere we go. Um, Thank you, Holly. <laughs> well, she's been instrumental in getting us connected all over the community. And she's, I mean, she even when the staff is not able to be at the center, Rachel's there filling in for the staff. So that's wow. the kind of dedication you, you want. Um, she's also, right. I did want to mention the school system has been engaged with the project mm -hmm. as well. So we've uh, been talking with the superintendent and the principals and so that's important that the school children are able to access the services and their parents so we've been engaged with them and rachel's been great at helping us to get connected with them okay awesome. yeah i'd just like to say that's a uh, a good move there because you know the younger generation they are so adept to technology and and high tech type stuff so getting them involved will bring their parents along because a lot of their parents and in particular studies say that minority communities like the hispanic community and the african american community they're a little bit reluctant to try new things like this especially from a technological standpoint so having the younger kids involved that will probably help uh, make them feel more comfortable the other thing i wanted to ask you both is what have the media coverage been on on med and what you guys have uh, been doing with on med how has that been for you uh, well, fortunately, we have had a lot of media attention. Um, our local newspapers have been at a few of our events and um, done articles for us locally, um, but we've also had um, some other news channels in um, neighboring communities who come out and do um, news reports on what we have going on. Um, we were on the um, Alabama AgCast with Alpha, their podcast. Um, we've gone around um, to various conferences and spoke our core team um, to talk about this at nationwide conferences. Um, and so we have thankfully been able to get a lot of attention um, both locally and not locally. I'm going to, I'm going to Go send ahead. you a link um, that includes all of our, uh, most of our news clips and that it also includes more information about um, the, the project as a whole if your viewers are interested in sure. learning more okay. about the project or even how they can be engaged we love having volunteers as well okay are Great. there national implications can is this something that can spread beyond the state of alabama yeah um absolutely i i talk with um uh, i talk with uh, the folks that the Tom and with Howard regularly. They're the new C execs um, for OnMed. And I know that they're looking at expanding this in California and in other areas across the United States. And in fact, I'm headed down to Tampa uh, later this week and I'm going to go and visit their office. I haven't seen their office yet. So I'm looking forward to that. Rachel, and do you have more information? I remember when we first got involved, that was one at Texas A&M. Was it Texas A&M? Yeah. I so think? there's four local, four nationwide, four of these on-med stations nationwide. So, and two of them are in Alabama. Um, and so that's really cool that we have two here um, at Tuskegee and in Lafette. Um, but yeah, there's one in Cameron, Texas that Texas A&M had gotten. And then there's one in Las Vegas too, I think. Is that right? Holly. I think so. And we yeah. actually flew our flu, our team flew out to Texas A&M a couple of years ago so that we could be real familiar with the product. And that's what really fired us up. Once yeah, we got to that was exciting. Action. It was. Good deal. <laughs> okay. Anything else from anybody? 
All right, man, this has been wonderful. Thank you guys so much. And I oh, want I you do to have one more thing. Okay. Um, one more thing. Um, uh, we, we definitely want people to come and visit the station and they need to know that there's no charge for the service right now. Right. At least up okay. until July 1st, we are not charging anything for the service. So even if folks already have a primary care provider, we would encourage them to just come and check out the, uh, come check out the technology. That's great. Okay. And if you guys would give Dr. Cook my congratulations. Uh, I know he's worked on this a long time. And uh, so it's come to fruition. Great. Wonderful. Thanks. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Okay. So my closing commentary for today, or as I see it, is I spoke earlier about my my mom and her insistence on my attending John Carroll Catholic High School. I'd like to reflect on the other half of my parents' partnership. I read a piece on this guy, Kavon Looney. Kavon Looney, you may not have heard of him. He was a professional basketball player for the Golden State Warriors. And no, he didn't flash a gun on anybody. He's not a big star, but he is to some but not one of the biggest stars on the team. He's a star to his parents. Looney is 27 years old, and he has a habit of phoning his parents after every ball game. They play 82 games plus playoffs. He phones them separately. After the game, he calls his mom, then he calls his dad, and they discuss the game that has just ended, and they give him their take on what has happened and what he did or didn't do during the game. Looney's phone call reminded me of my relationship with my, my buddy. That was my name for my dad, who passed away two years ago this June. We were buddies. As a matter of fact, that's how we greeted each other. Hey, buddy, I would say, and he would return, hey, buddy, how you been? My dad was buddies with my friends, particularly when my mom passed and he lived alone. My friends, Manuel Cool and Steve and my brother-in-law, Big Emmett, we would meet at my dad's and we would sit on the front porch and just laugh and talk. And daddy had these great stories. And when mom pushed us three kids to go to Catholic school, daddy went out and got a second job to afford the tuition. Looney's relationship with his parents reminded me of my buddy when I was playing ball and how my dad always wanted to discuss what he had observed during the ball games. My parents came to every home game and he liked to ask me about particular incidents during the game. Uh, he said, he would say, I saw coach so-and-so come over and talk to you while you were on the bench resting. Uh, what did he say? <laughs> I would relay what had occurred, what the coach said, he'd think on it, and then he'd relay some wisdom about my behavior, particularly when I was upset, to be honest, I was pissed off about not getting the ball and exhibiting some negative behavior. You know that won't help you in the long run, he'd quietly say. Yes, I know I would return, but he would let that he would let the butt slide, but he had made his point. Then we would enjoy the game that I just played. They were special moments. I can imagine those phone calls are very special for Kevon Looney. I know that feeling. And that is how I see it on this May 16th in the year 2023. That's our show for today. I want to thank the audience. We appreciate you. I want to thank our G-List guest. Dr. Holly Cost and Rachel Snotty. Thank our sponsor, Best Girl. Thank Barbara, Sean, Joyce. And that's it for this Tuesday, May the 16th in the year 2023. Remember, enjoy yourself. Make every day count. Stay safe. Peace.